the answer is that all of these U's harness disorder to generate a new form of order. Well, I'm a biologist and I think that for the idea of beauty to be meaningful in biology, it has to support the idea of meaning in life. And to do that, it must be able to explain the most significant characteristics of living organisms, and that is the solving of life's problems. As the philosopher Karl Popper famously said, all life is problem solving. So, beauty, to be related to biology, must be able to explain why. One, bacteria evolve rapidly, within days, to avoid annihilation by antibiotics. Two, cancerous tumors evolve rapidly to resist and recover from their destruction by painful chemo and radiotherapy. And three, multicellular life like you and me has evolved highly evolving immune systems that can, within days again, not generations, produce new DNA sequences that can be used to build new antibodies to neutralize bacteria or viruses. And so, I propose that the standard view of beauty in nature cannot achieve these properties um, of living systems. Because a perfectly symmetric object, our natural view of beauty, for example, in architecture, a Greek temple, or a radially symmetric rose flower, or a completely regular crystal, cannot be the basis of genuine evolution of problem-solving living systems. That is also clear when we consider the limitations of our computers. When they follow perfectly determinate algorithms, they produce perfectly regular outcomes. That is why people who wish to succeed in longer-term predictions, for example in our weather systems, resort to adding noise to their computations. A recent book by the Oxford physicist Tim Palmer, The Primacy of Doubt, explains this initially counterintuitive idea beautifully well. But isn't noise, chaotic randomness, the very opposite of the Greek temple concept of beauty? Well, yes, you don't build a Greek temple by just randomly throwing stones together. So, the dilemma here is that perfect symmetry seems to be the very antithesis of creativity. It's static, it's unchanging. Does that mean that we have to change our concept of symmetry as a model of beauty? Well, here I come to a story. Just before the pandemic, I collaborated with the philosopher and writer Benedict Rattigan, who approached me in 2019 to see whether a problem in symmetry that he was working on could relate to and be strengthened by my work on multiscale causation in biology, a concept that I refer to as biological relativity. He told me about the ancient Greek philosopher Heraclitus. He also pointed out to me the creative artists, architects, painters, musicians. <coughs> they all avoid complete regularity, and some East Asian artists seem to do that very deliberately. A temple may not have complete symmetry. So could it be that there is a deeper concept of symmetry than the concept of pure symmetry? I could hardly believe my ears. I listened to his exposition because that is precisely what I have been working on recently. Return, finally, to a moment, the bacteria seeking to avoid annihilation by antibiotics the cancerous tumors recovering aggressively from radio or chemotherapy, or our immune systems going into overdrive to produce new DNA sequences uh, during a pandemic. The answer is that all of these use harness disorder to generate a new form of order. So my proposal is the deepest form of beauty, of symmetry, if you wish, is precisely 
the symmetry between order and disorder. That, in my view, is the yin and the yang of the universe. Most relevant to this session is that Ratchikan and I explored this idea of symmetry between order and disorder with other Oxford people from art, music, mathematics, logic, philosophy, physics, biology in the books has just been published called appropriately the language of symmetry sorry for the advertisement but there is my contribution to the concept of beauty and how it relates to the meaning of life thank you very much okay so now i'd like to open up the discussion and i'll start off with a very simple question is beauty objective so I'll throw to you first george <laughs> Okay. Simple. So now, can you measure beauty by a scientific experiment? Can you get a meter and you point it and it says this is two milli Rembrandts? <laughs> okay. And the answer is no, it's not objective in that kind of sense. Well, it, it makes me think what is actually objective? What is objectivity? Is it Correct. something you can measure or? Exactly. So what is objective? What is truth? That's where you've got to start off, actually. Yeah. Um, the, the question is, can you obtain consensus on beauty by intelligent people? And I think to a large degree, the answer is yes. But assessment of beauty is indeed culturally dependent. And that is where the problem arises that, for instance, I find it difficult to relate to Japanese music. <laughs> Absolutely beautiful to Japanese people, but I find it difficult to relate to. So the problem is cultural dependence. But let me give you two proofs that beauty is real. And the first proof is it exists is that people of all cultures will pay for it. And if you pay for something, it must be real. <laughs> and I've, we've just been looking for a house in a little town called Fisher on the Sea. And there's some wonderful houses where you look down on the sea and the waves and the surfers and all that. And they cost twice as much as houses further along where the sea is over there in the distance. So beauty has real monetary value in that proves it exists and people pay large sums of money to go on cruises to um, Norway to 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 Taiwan and all, to, to all sorts of places so, so uh, I think that is a an economic proof of the existence of beauty and the second is the one which I've already mentioned in evolutionary sense uh, beauty is certainly real uh, because otherwise you cannot explain why flowers are beautiful, why uh, hummingbirds are beautiful and all the rest of it. Has, as Dennis says, it has to serve a purpose. The purpose is sexual selection and that's a key feature. The underlying purpose is to have a, a bigger gene pool of variation from which you can select. And there, so there's a mechanism there by which beauty actually is a causal agent of importance in biology and that proves it exists in that context. I have a question why we find flowers beautiful. What's it an uh, evolutionary advantage for us to find? Uh, for us it's a secondary thing. For, for that, <laughs> what's important is that the, the, male, the female bird finds the male bird. For pollination. Uh, yeah. Yeah, okay. And, 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 and uh, in the case of the bee and the flower, it's not clear if it's beauty or just. Um, but but in the case of the of, of of the male and the female birds, there's no question about it. The peacock tail is right. there. Yes, yeah, I think the beauty there is the smell. Oh, the it's flower. It's the odor. Yes, right. it's beautiful. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. But it's, aesthetically, I find I was driving past just a hedgerow today, and I was like, "That's beautiful." and was wondering yeah. why I found it beautiful. Yeah. So, so the question is, what about the different cultural aspects? And I'm very aware of different cultures. And I think one can go to the theory of relativity here, which is my field of expertise, and the space-time. 
it's a central feature of Einstein's theory can be expressed in different coordinate systems and it looks different in the different coordinates. If it change coordinates, it looks completely different. And I think that might be an analogy that beauty has got a kind of a deeper level and different cultures are able to extract from it a different kinds of aspects of the beauty, which is really beautiful. But Lo likes it, yeah. Um, yes, yeah, so... Uh no, I don't think beauty is about monetizing something. And I think the intrinsic reason I disagree with this, I think, is because this is really seeing us as the arbiters of what is beautiful. And it's a point of view which places us as somehow determining what equation works because we find it beautiful or objectively what is beautiful because we determine it to be so. And I take the point of view where there's an infinite unknown we have not yet encountered. And I take the point of view that we approach things with an attitude of wonder, of encountering something beyond us, that we're transported to something beyond us. That is what I find truly beautiful. Yes, the things we might find aesthetic. Um, I don't think that, you know, only Japanese people would appreciate Japanese theater. Um, but that's neither here or there. I think that's at the level of aesthetically, what have we determined that we would term that, well, collectively, we like this. I think that's a preference of we like something, we would pay for it, we don't like something. I think that places us in the position of arbiter where we're making decisions, I think, beauty, nature, infinite wonder is vastly beyond us and is not something to be monetized or ascertained by what we determine or cultures differ about or what we put a price on. I'll be very quick. No, please carry um, on. The symmetry between order and disorder, which I agree is a strange symmetry, but it's fundamental, can easily be measured. I can measure the speed at which bacteria hypermutate their genomes, in other words, harness stochasticity in order to escape the problem of antibiotics. I can easily measure the way in which a cancerous tumor does the same kind of thing, uses disorder in order to find a new form of order, which is its own survival. And we can do the same for immune systems in our bodies. So I, I think it's easily measurable. By my definition, but I think only by my definition. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. So I'd like to move on to another question I have, which is, does the centrality of beauty to our scientific theories tell us something about the very character of the nature of reality in the universe? So I'll throw to you first, Sujitra. Um, sure. So, um, so firstly, I think that mathematical equations are important. One can seek beauty in them. And we had a talk about string theory earlier. And one can seek elegance in it. That's great. But it's also self-contained. Um, and I'm sure George knows much more about Wittgenstein than I do. But the idea that an equation can be selected for its self-consistency, for its beauty, that's incredible. But does it tell us anything outside of the equation itself? And that's where I would say reality or matter or what I'm talking about of these emergent phenomena that we have not yet encountered that are not captured within the equation. Those can only be sought by looking, by encountering, by experimenting, by knowing there's a world outside the equation and not for the ultimate pursuit being finding an elegant equation that somehow is meant to capture everything in this neat package, but recognizing that's beautiful and important, but there's a world outside, reality, what we're encountering, um, matter, the universe, is not contained within that beautiful, elegant equation. But I, I would um, ask that it seems that the beauty seems to be a... A, a tool that we've used to guide us in developing scientific theories. So how would you, you think that plays yeah, into... Uh, sure, that's what I mean. So I think that um, there obviously is a role for equations and models and mathematics. Clearly, this is useful and interesting, 
but I don't think it's the entirety. I think it's it's like a it's like a line drawing, but it doesn't you know have the richness of phenomena that are beyond what's captured by that. George, do you have anything to add to this? Um, yeah. Uh, so beauty of scientific theories the standard model of particle physics is not a beautiful theory it's an incredibly complicated mess <laughs> okay um, but Maxwell's equations is beautiful and it gives you electromagnetic waves in a very clear and beautiful way so that's a contrast what I think is beautiful in a sense is what underlies it and this relates to Dennis and I'm not quite sure if you understand this in enough detail that underlying all of physics is the idea of symmetry. Symmetry groups underlie all of physics. And then in real outcomes, like part, broken symmetries underlie particle physics. And so yeah, those ideas are beautiful. There are actually emergent forms of matter that are not underlied by broken symmetries. They go beyond broken symmetries. There's ways in which certain emergent forms of matter are defined that are not just in terms of a broken symmetry that can be local aspects of it, so topological aspects yeah, yeah, of it. Abs absolutely. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. So I would say that goes beyond just symmetry, right? For, for that, that applies to yeah, some physics does emerge out of broken symmetry step and some, some does not. The standard model of particle physics arises out of broken symmetry. So some does, but there's also ones that don't. <laughs> okay. But with the breaking of symmetry, I think you're close to what I'm referring to as the strange symmetry between order and disorder. Yeah. Because but, that seems to me to be fundamental. But, but I think where the real beauty of physics comes is, is what it allows. And it allows those things you're talking about, but much more it allows biology to come into existence. Exactly. It allows the genes to come into existence, the proteins, the folding nature of the proteins. And I think it is absolutely beautiful the way that happens and then allows developmental biology to take place. It allows each of us to grow out of a single fertilized cell Indeed. in a process which is extraordinarily reliable. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.